from Hollywood, it's time now for... Johnny Dollar. Bert Major, Masters Insurance and Trust. Oh, hi, Bert. What's up? Poor little rich girl in California wants to take out a $200,000 straight life policy on her husband with herself as beneficiary. A lot of dough, but not too unusual, if you can afford it. Effective in two weeks and hush-hush, a surprise. But who'd want to... Why? Exactly. Nice piece of change for the company in commissions or for her in payoff if she's playing that kind of a game. You talk like you don't know her. Name only. Deal was arranged pending through her lawyer in Los Angeles. Hmm. You could be out there in the morning, Johnny. All right, Bert. Who gives me the fill-in? Our agent out there, Roger Hackey. He'll meet you at International Airport. Bob Bailey in the exciting adventures of the man with the action-packed expense account. America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. And now, act one of yours truly, Johnny Dollar. (laughs) Expense account submitted by Special Investigator Johnny Dollar. To the Home Office, Masters Insurance and Trust Company, Hartford, Connecticut. Following is an account of expenses incurred during my investigation of the poor little rich girl matter. Expense account item one, $280, round-trip plane ticket and incidentals, including sunglasses, Hartford to Los Angeles. I arrived, rested, ready, and right on schedule. Also on schedule was Roger Hackey, Masters Los Angeles agent who turned out to be a repressed comedian, become insurance salesman. Yep, I said to myself, that's Johnny Dollar, I said. You are Johnny Dollar, aren't you? In person. You Roger Hackey? In person. (laughs) You got the old feel, haven't you? Simpatico, we call it out here. (laughs) Uh, Have a nice trip? Yeah. Uh, Good, good. Airplanes scare me. Don't like being up there in the wild blue yonder. Terra Verma is my dish of tea. (laughs) Slow but sure, they call me. Yeah, well, look. Now, if you just follow me, we'll jump in my jalopy, and I'll have you at the Beverly Hilton before you can say happy hooligan. You said. Huh? Oh, yeah. (laughs) Well, here we go. Cloud of dust and all that. The ride from the air terminal to the hotel was hot, silent on my part, and unproductive so far as the case was concerned. Roger Hackey kept up a running commentary on everything from bad actors to the Zodiac. It wasn't until I was settled in my room with drink in hand and shoeless feet propped up that I could get him to switch to the $200,000 surprise. Her name is Cynthia Durbin. Now, how much do you know about her? Nothing. Bert Major said you'd give me the background. Now, well, she's a strange one. You know what a chameleon is? Well, sure, a lizard that changes color, so what? So, that's the kind of a gal Cynthia Durbin is. At least she is now. You're losing me, Roger. Begin at the beginning. Now, you're the doctor. As the Siamese twins said after the operation, what's missing? (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. How did you meet Cynthia Durbin? Well, she came into the office yesterday. No call, no appointment. There she was. Oh, what's she like? Trim. Real trim. And expensive. Just casually announced she wanted to buy $200,000 worth of insurance, huh? Well, not exactly. She started asking about various policies, you know, endowments, straight life, etc., and how and when they paid off. And she kept giving me the big eye and cross-leg routine. Hmm. she tell you anything about herself? Oh, didn't have to. I already knew. She's practically a fixture in the society section of the Sunday papers. Garden parties, opening nights, and all that. Yeah, but only lately. Her husband? Peter Durbin. He's been a public figure ever since they got married about three years ago. But she hasn't. No, no, just the last couple of months or so. Uh How old is she? Oh, around 25. Blonde, blooming, and gorgeous, figuratively speaking. (laughs) I take it she has the money, huh? Yeah, right. He was a well-torsoed movie bit player with a champagne appetite. I see. Now, uh, what about this surprise angle? Well, she came right to the point. Said her husband had just had a complete physical. Asked if his doctor's report would be acceptable. If so, okay. But she didn't sign her up. Why? Well, she didn't give me the chance. What do you mean? All of a sudden, she reached in her purse and pulled out a piece of paper with a name and address on it. Announced this was her attorney. See him, she said. Smiled big and walked out. Did you go and see the attorney? Right away. A guy by the name of uh, Crane Collins. Has big plush offices downtown, old senior partner type. What did he have to say? Oh, nothing except routine questions about filling out the forms, uh, expediting the procedure, importance of secrecy for the surprise. Why didn't you ask a few questions? Couldn't. What do you mean, couldn't? She was there. Doing what? 
sitting back in a corner, all huddled up like a mouse waiting to be pounced on. Didn't say a word while Collins and I filled out the papers. Hmm. Yeah, she signed them as if they were a death warrant. Went back to the corner and stared at the wall. Now I see what you meant by that comedian remark. Yeah, she's too much for me. Yeah. A leopard can change its spots, too. Expense account item two, $3.25 taxi fare to the offices of Crane Collins. So far, all I knew was that the wealthy young woman wanted a pot full of insurance on her husband. If it hadn't been for the surprise request, it would have been routine. Now it wasn't. And the people involved, one of them at least, were not routine. I was ushered into an oak panel office high above the streets of Los Angeles. Good afternoon, Mr. Dollar. Mr. Collins. Your card identifies you as an insurance investigator, Mr. Dollar. I don't believe I understand. Cynthia Durbin is your client? Why, yes. You represented this client yesterday in the signing of an application for a $200,000 straight life insurance policy on her husband. Yes? I represent the company. Everything is in order, is it not? Insurance is a, a lot of things, Mr. Collins. A surprise to the insured is one of the things it isn't. My client is adamant in this respect. Call it a, a quirk, if you will. You expect the company to issue a $200,000 policy on a quirk? <clears throat> well, How long now, have you known Mrs. Durbin? Since she was born. Then you know her father? Knew him. I am his executor. Uh-huh. Mother? Also deceased. Both parents died when Cynthia was 17. I was her guardian and have been her legal advisor since she came of age. Was she well provided for? Very. What kind of a man is her husband? Young, about 30, tall, good-looking. No, no, Mr. Collins, not statistics. Your impressions. He plays an excellent game of golf. Gets along well with people when he wants to. But you don't like him, do you? In this profession, Mr. Dollar, I neither like nor dislike people. I represent them, and that representation is based on fact. Well, in my profession, we go by feel as well as fact. Well, tell me candidly, Mr. Collins, do you think there's anything strange about this request for insurance on her husband? As I said, I deal in facts, not feelings. As a client, she sought professional assistance. Ergo, I supplied it. Where do the Durbans live? I'd rather Oh, not. now, look, I can get it from any society editor in town. My secretary will give you the information. All right, thank you. By the way, don't tell Mrs. Durbin or anyone else that we've had this discussion. If you do, there will be no insurance issued. Interference with investigative procedure. Fact, Mr. Collins. I understand. Expense account item three, $2.60, phone call. Then taxi to Roger Hackey's office. A neat one-story building in the Miracle Mile on Wilshire Boulevard. Purpose? To borrow Roger's company car. The Durbins lived in one of those colonial mansions out in Beverly Hills, surrounded by curving driveways, spacious lawns, swimming pool and cabanas, all of it enclosed by thick high walls and electronically controlled gates. The mention of insurance on the intercom got me in. Cynthia Durbin was everything Roger said she was, the first time he met her, that is. Please excuse my appearance, Mr. Dollar. I've been swimming. Oh, I, I, uh, I don't mind at all, Mrs. Durbin. <laughs> really, you shouldn't have come here to deliver the policy. What if my husband had been home? No surprise. No, and that would have spoiled everything. Well, may I have it, please? Uh, the uh, paperwork has not been completed yet. Then what are you doing here? What do you want? Get to the point. Well, just a few questions, Mrs. Durbin. My colleague, Mr. Hackey, should have handled these details yesterday, but he was somewhat uh, rushed. Oh, then there's nothing wrong with... Would you care for a drink, Mr. Dollar? Thanks. The bar's out by the pool. Shall we? She was wearing a bikini and high-heeled beach sandals, and she led the way. I was hoping it was two miles to the pool instead of the 75 yards it turned out to be. I mixed the drinks, and we settled down in a couple of sun lounges. Ah, oh, those details, Mr. Dollar. Mm, just formalities, actually. You ought to be the beneficiary? Yes. That was discussed yesterday. Oh, yes, it was. 
What does your husband do, Mrs. Durbin? He doesn't work, if that's what you mean. He doesn't have to. I have enough for both of us. Johnny. Yeah? Freshen my drink, please. Oh, sure. Say, so tell me, did you ever contemplate divorce? Divorce? Whatever makes you ask a question like that? Well? Of course not. We've had our differences, minor ones. But a couple hasn't. Yeah, I suppose you got a point there. Here you are. Thank you. Johnny. Why did you pick two weeks from today to be the effective date of the policy? Isn't that my business? His birthday, Mrs. Durbin? What? Your husband, the surprise. Well, yes, yes it is, but all these questions... Plan to throw a big party for him? Yes. No, I don't know. Johnny... Your husband would be worth a lot more to you dead than alive, wouldn't he, Mrs. Durbin? Hand me that robe, please. Sure, sure. There you are. But you haven't answered my question. I'm sorry, you... You'll have to excuse me. I have a headache. A terrible headache. Something was definitely wrong here. A girl of her age should have flared at my questions. Should have snapped back at me instead of blindly running away. Yeah, something was wrong, all right. But I'd seen what I'd come to see. Both facets of Cynthia Durbin's personality. And was one of them actually thinking in terms of murder? My job, find out. Act two of yours truly, Johnny Dollar, in a moment. An interesting parallel hit me the other day. When a baby takes its first three steps, everybody is happy and gives a cheer for its progress. The same thing happens when a country takes important steps toward lasting world peace and freedom. That great American patriot, Benjamin Franklin, outlined three important steps in the drive toward a lasting world peace and freedom of mankind. The last and most important of these steps was, and is, to get the people of the world to talk to each other and to help each other. This is the essence of the people-to-people program that Americans have put into operation all over the world. It has been such a great success that it is beginning to work both ways. Not too long ago in Korea, Tom Lawrence, a yeoman in the United States Navy, lost his wallet on a street in Seoul. The wallet was found by a 15-year-old Korean boy who gave it to his father. The father promptly returned it to Lawrence with nothing missing. Tom Lawrence decided that this kind of honesty should pay off. He visited the seven members of the Korean family and gave them 80 pounds of rice. He then promised to bring the family 50 pounds of rice each month he remained in Korea. The Korean father said, I think this is much more than I deserve. Maybe it was, and maybe it wasn't. But who can put a price on better understanding among the peoples of the world? For through better understanding of each other comes an understanding of freedom, the right of all men, everywhere. And now, act two of yours truly, Johnny Dollar, and the poor little rich girl matter. I sat beside one of the plushest swimming pools in Beverly Hills, alone. I finished my drink slowly. Cynthia Durbin was a strange one, all right, but her actions seemed compulsory rather than natural. If she really was thinking about murder for $200,000 in one chunk, she was pretty crude about it. If she was trying to impress her husband for some unknown reason, she'd selected a mighty offbeat way to do it. If she was going off her rocker, well... The extension phone hung on a post beside the bar. I don't ordinarily listen in on other people's conversations, but this one. Anything wrong, darling? Eric. Oh, Eric, I've got to talk to you. Something has happened. I thought... No, Cynthia, not on the phone. Meet me here in half an hour. But, Eric... Half an hour. Here. Goodbye, Cynthia. Hello, Eric. As I strolled to my car, nobody asked me to come back again sometime. Not that I expected it. I parked a block down the street, adjusted the rearview mirror, and got comfortable. A cigarette later, she came zooming out in a CAD convertible and headed my way. I've tailed a few cars in my time, but this kid was either scared silly or she'd learned her evasive tactics from Bull Halsey. 
I lost her in the first ten blocks. So I drove Roger Hackey's car back to his office and prepared for the horse laugh I had coming. It came. <laughs> she lost you, huh? Oh, that's a dandy, a real dandy. Hey, tell me, do you always <laughs> laugh when you're about to lose the commission on a $200,000 policy? Yeah? Oh. No. Well, uh, what are you going to do now, Johnny? Who is Eric? Well, he's not a brother, that's for sure. Oh. I don't know. You know, for two cents, I'd turn in a negative report and go on back to Hartford. Oh, wait now. You can't do that. This is a big deal. For you. For me, it's a pain in the neck. But you can't turn in a negative report just because she's got an extracurricular boyfriend. You don't even know who he is. And what about her husband? Yeah, what about him? Here, here. I got the dope right here. Today's paper. And it's a good picture of him. Read what it says. Peter Durbin, one of Los Angeles' better amateur golfers, plays out of Silver Oak Country Club where the state open is being held this week. He's expected to finish in the top. Roger, what time is it? Uh, 4.30. Thanks. Huh? Hey, where are you going? I'm going to try my hand at being a reporter. What? What are you talking about? Roger, I'm going to interview Mr. Peter Durbin for the, uh, the Interstate Publicity Press Association. Huh? Expense account item four, $2.40. Cab fare to the Silver Oak Country Club, which nestled in a big ravine north of Sunset Boulevard, some 15 minutes from Roger's office. The last players were coming in for the afternoon round when I got there, and Peter Durbin was among them. I waited until after the radio and TV boys had got through and then caught him in a corner of the locker room. Yes? Who are you? Johnny Dollar, Interstate Publicity Press. I'd like to ask you a few questions, please. Well, I've already given my interviews. Well, sure, I know, but this is uh, feature stuff. Best part of the day. There's the gallery body or stuff like that. Oh. Oh, all right, but make it quick. Yes, sir. Is your wife here? No, she never watches me play. Oh, where is she now? Well, at home. Where else? But now, see here, don't uh, you... Think... You're playing a great game, Mr. Durbin. You figure you're going to win this tournament, huh? Uh, yes, I think so. McMahon has turned into 69, of course, but I'm still three strokes up on him. I, um, I play a much steadier game than he does. Oh, yeah, sure. This is your home club, isn't it? Oh, yes. It's one of the best in the country. Yeah, mighty fine course. You must be pretty well healed. Well, I... Uh... <laughs> That's none of your readers' concern. Oh, I'm sorry. Say, you have a birthday coming up soon, haven't you? How did you know? Oh, well, you're a prominent personality, Mr. Durbin. We keep a file on this sort of thing, on important people like you. Oh, oh I see. Oh, sure. I suppose you're going to have a big affair. Uh, no, as a matter of fact, the annual Western Road Races fall on my birthday each year. As a reporter, you should recall that I won both last year and the year before. Oh, yeah, sure. Well, happy birthday, Mr. Durbin, and uh, good luck. Well... Is that all you want? That's all I need to know. Thanks. Act three of yours truly, Johnny Dollar, in a moment. No folklore could be all boastful and dynamic. Some of it is about the man at the bottom of the pile. Like the one they tell of the traveler who just had to get across a river. He argued with the boatman, but that boatman wasn't about to move. Nope. Not with the spring thaw making it a mighty ugly river. The traveler was insistent. Finally, the boatman agreed. But it was going to cost a whole quarter to get across. But I ain't got but 15 cents. You gotta take me for that. Your regular fare's only 10 cents. The boatman stood firm. I ain't going, that's all. Anybody that ain't got but 15 cents, it just don't make no difference which side of the river he's on anyhow. <laughs> Folklore belongs to every nation's legendary past. And I guess we Americans have our share of some good ones. Like the one about... Ah, but we'll have to save that one for the next time we travel your way. See you then. And now, Act Three of Yours Truly, Johnny Dollar and the Poor Little Rich Girl Matter. Expense account item five, six dollars even. Taxi fare to the office of Attorney Crane Collins, with whom I could now agree on one point. I didn't like Peter Durbin either. It was 6.15, after hours, when I entered the office of Collins, Douglas, Walsh, Hanley, and James. The senior partner was still there. His door was slightly ajar, and I heard voices, which stopped abruptly when I entered. Oh, Mr. Dollar. Rather late in the day, isn't it? I don't keep office hours, Mr. Collins. I'm very busy. Then I'll wait. Very well, as you wish. I wished, so I waited. But not for long. Because about three minutes later, Collins came out, carefully closed the door of his office behind him, and strode easily toward me, oozing his most charming professional smile. Now, Mr. Dollar, 
What can I do for you? Why didn't you tell me the first time I was here that Peter Durbin, in addition to being a first-class golfer, was also a racing enthusiast? Why, it just didn't occur to me. Do you know any insurance company in the world that would issue a $200,000 policy on a man who risks his life in a racing car? Then your company will not issue the policy? What do you think? Now tell me something. Who is Eric? Eric? That's right. Well... The name is not familiar to me. Now, look, Mr. Collins, I have a feeling that even you will admit that withholding information in connection with a possible murder is punishable by law. Fact. I am fully aware of that, but I fail to see what that... Ha what are you doing? You didn't invite me into your office. I just wondered why is all. Have you no ethics, man? Cynthia Durbin was in there a few minutes ago, wasn't she? Mr. Dollar. Wasn't she? If it is the intention of your company not to issue the insurance to my client, I will so inform her, and that will end the matter so far as you are concerned. Now, please be good enough to leave. You really don't know or care what's going on, do you? You are so wrapped up in the letter of the law that preventing a possible murder doesn't even occur to you. Another one of your feelings? Well, I don't have the remotest idea what you're talking about. Good night, Mr. Dollar. Good night, Mr. Collins. Expense account item six, nine dollars and fifty cents. Cocktails and dinner. I should have written my report negative and hightailed it back to Hartford. But when you see in your mind's eye the possibility of a racing car careening off the road at 125 miles an hour exactly two weeks from now, you don't just stick to business and call it quits. Eric, wherever he tended bar, was the key. But how to find it? I was on dessert in the evening paper, giving my subconscious mind a chance to work it out when all of a sudden I was looking at it on the society page. Expense account item seven, $19, including taxi fare to Los Angeles police headquarters, where I had a pleasant chat with the captain on duty. Then a tuxedo rental in the same taxi to the Statler Hotel. A special pass let me in as guest at a crowded and bejeweled society benefit. Enjoying the party, Mr. Collins? Dollar, what are you doing here? Enjoying the party, too. Have Mr. and Mrs. Durbin arrived? You are the most annoyingly persistent individual I please, have ever... Please, no compliments. See you later. After a few minutes, I spotted her, dressed to the teeth. She turned suddenly and saw me. I expected surprise, chagrin, fear, most anything but what I got. Johnny, I am glad to see you. I was such a bore this afternoon, forgive me. Well, your exit was rather sudden. <laughs> My headache's all gone, isn't that wonderful? Fine. Will you dance with me? Pleasure. Dollar. That's such an exciting name. Is your husband with you tonight? No, poor dear. He's playing in a golf tournament and has to get his rest. You came alone? Yes. Don't you find it warm in here, all these people? Let's go out on the terrace, hmm? Sure, why not? Once more, I was following her. And it was just as interesting as the first time. But my mind and eyes were elsewhere. Somewhere in this crowd was the Eric I was looking for. He had to be. Then I spotted him. 35, big and broad, hawk nose, circling toward the terrace from the left. She threaded her way to a potted palm in a far corner of the terrace, turned and looked at me. Her eyes were feverishly bright in the moonlight. She was beautiful. You're a very charming man, Johnny. I wish... You wish what? Mm. Do you find me interesting? You haven't answered my question. Oh, I find you interesting, Cynthia. Who is Eric? Eric. The man you went to see this afternoon after you left me. This afternoon? You know who I'm talking about. Because you and Eric, I don't know how, were planning to kill your husband two weeks from now and collect $200,000 insurance. Two weeks from now in the road race. Make it look like an accident, no doubt. No, Eric! No! I ducked and whirled around as a fist grazed past my ear and brought up one from the floor with all I had. <laughs> Cynthia stood there a moment, then 
quietly folded up and lay on the floor in a heap, sobbing. Oh, there you are, Della. Oh. What have you done to this poor girl? And that man? Very simple, Collins. I've been combining feel and fact. The house dick and I got them out of there. Hawk knows to police headquarters, Cynthia to a hospital. Eric turned out to be a quack psychiatrist who preyed on unstable rich women and who was wanted in both New York and Florida. He had a perfect setup in Cynthia Durbin until he went for murder and the big money. Mrs. Durbin, well, the doctors tell me she ought to be normal mentally in a couple of years with proper psychiatric treatment. Expense account total, $317.75. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. star will return in just a moment. Our flag now numbers 50 stars, and behind each star there stands yet another flag, representing one of the 50 states. North Carolina state flag bears the initial of her name on either side of a white star. Above, on a yellow scroll, is the date May 20th, 1775. Below, on a similar scroll, is the date April 12th, 1776. The 1775 date stands for an early declaration of independence, known as the Mecklenburg Declaration of Independence. April 12, 1776, was the date of the first constitutional convention held in Halifax. The Halifax Resolve was a document that placed the old North State in the front rank, both in point of time and spirit, among those colonies which demanded unconditional freedom and absolute independence from any foreign power. North Carolina state flag, the flag of the 12th state to the Union, was adopted on March 9, 1885. Now, here's our star to tell you about next week's story. Next week, a beautiful yacht, a beautiful, charming girl, and a man who wished he'd never heard of either of them. Join us, won't you? Yours truly, Johnny Duff. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar, starring Bob Bailey, originates in Hollywood. Written by Alan Botzer, it is produced and directed by Jack Johnstone. Heard in our cast were Virginia Gregg, Herb Ellis, Frank Nelson, Marvin Miller, and Peter Leeds. Be sure to join us next week, same time and station, for another exciting story of Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. This is Bud Sewell speaking. This is the United States Armed Forces Radio and Television Service. <laughs>